for tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Saturday morning, November the 15th, 1969. Tri-City Chapter of the Full Gospel Venice Men's Fellowship in San Francisco, California. With Dr. Derek Prince. If you'd like to change the position of your chair so that you're not twisting your neck round to look at me, I think you'd be more comfortable and more restful. And it is the place of God's word in your life. To my way of thinking, there is no greater and more urgent need amongst full gospel people, charismatic people, full gospel businessmen, or whatever you like to call them, than to get them into the word of God. There are two scriptures in the Old Testament which to me are a very vivid description of the present situation amongst God's people. The one is in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 13, which says this, My people are gone into captivity through lack of knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Now to me that's a vivid, up-to-date picture of the people of God living in captivity when they should be free, many times living in defeat, fear, and unrest when they should be living in peace, victory, and abundance. Their honorable men, their doctors of divinity, their theologians, their seminary professors are famished, they're starving, and a starving man has nothing to offer to others, and their multitude are dried up with thirst. And the root basic cause is lack of knowledge of the word of God. In Hosea 4, 6, similar statement is made. My people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest unto me. Because thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. I'll tell you that I've been gripped in recent weeks by that revelation from the Word of God that if God's people forget God's law, God will forget their children. And I suppose that's probably the great basic reason for the tremendous revolt of the young people of the United States. Their parents have forgotten the law of God. And God says, if you forget my law, I'll forget your children. Now do not tell me this has not happened because I know it has. Everywhere I go, I'm consulted by frantic parents, perplexed about the awful condition into which their children have been led away. Do you want to know the great basic reason? The great basic reason is God's people have forgotten the law of God. They do not know what the Bible teaches. They are living in ignorance. Full gospel people say, we've got it all. But I'll tell you, friend, you've got no more than you've got. That's it. To the people that say we've got it all, I have two observations to make. First of all, if you've got it all, it shouldn't really be necessary to tell people, just demonstrate it. Secondly, if you've got it all, remember you'll be answerable for it all. To whom much is given, of him shall much also be required. Let's consider for a little while this morning the basis of God's provision for his people. Philippians 4.19 says this, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. How many of you believe that? All right. And how many of you have all your needs supplied? There is not a single thing lacking in your experience, spiritually, physically, financially, in your home, in your family. You have no need. Put your hand up. All right. So you believe it and you don't have it. Isn't that the truth? There's not one person put their hand up. You believe God will supply all you need and you're living in need and lack and frustration and insecurity. Why? Because God has supplied your need and you haven't discovered how and where to obtain the supply. God has nothing more to do for you than he's already done. All you have to do is appropriate what God has already offered you. God says he will supply all your need 
according to his riches in glory. And that means, I believe, that when God has supplied all the need of all his people, he'll still be pretty wealthy. God does not supply your need out of his lack, but out of his riches. God does not intend you to live in lack, but in abundance. You do not have to be poor to be holy. 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says this, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to all good works. Just in case you didn't absorb all that, and it's very hard to absorb that verse, because it contains five alls and two abounds. I'll say it again. God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to all good works. Can you find any room for lack, need, or insufficiency in that statement? God is able to do it. It's his grace. But grace has to be appropriated. Now, the great secret of appropriation, the source of supply, the means to obtain, is clearly set forth in the second epistle of Peter, the first chapter, verses 2, 3, and 4, where it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. I want you to listen to that third verse. I wonder if you could ask them to shut us off from the sounds that are coming from outside. Do you think you can do that? Uh-huh. It seems to me they've provided us with a rather inadequate place. All right. Well, we'll have to endure it. Okay. Coming back to the third verse, the first chapter, Second Peter. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things, that pertain unto life and godliness. Notice the past tense. God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life is an all-inclusive word. It covers every area of existence, every area of need. God has already given us everything. He is nothing more that he needs to give us. It is not in the future. It has already taken place. If you do not have all, it is not because God has not provided it. It is because you have not received it. Now, the channel of supply is through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. There is only... I'm going to speak so loud that they'll stop. There is only one channel of supply, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that God has to offer to us comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says God is able to make all grace abound toward us, that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to all good works. It is grace. And there is only one channel of grace, and that is Jesus Christ. John 1, 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Every provision of God's grace comes through only one channel, and that is Jesus Christ. And all that God has provided for us that pertains to life and godliness comes through the knowledge of him, Jesus Christ, who hath called us to glory and virtue. But the great secret of the supply, in the sense of practical appropriation, lies in the next verse, the fourth verse, whereby or in whom or through whom are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see that means of supply, it consists in one thing, which can be said in one word. What is that word? I didn't hear it. Jesus. No. We got on to verse 4 now. Jesus is the channel, but what is the means? All right, I'll say it again. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What is the means of supply in one word? 
promises. Thank you. That's it. In other words, the entire provision of God is already made for all his people. It's already available. It's available through one thing. What is that? The promises of God's word. So if you are living in lack instead of abundance, in defeat instead of victory, the great basic reason is that you do not know the promises of God. That's why God says, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. You either have not discovered the promises or you have not appropriated the promises because in the promises of God is contained the full and complete provision for every need that can ever arise in the life of any believer in time or eternity. God has nothing more to do. It is all done. God has no afterthoughts. He has no emergencies. He doesn't have to conduct any repairs. He doesn't have to remodel or redesign. The entire provision of God is complete and perfect as it stands. It's like Noah's Ark. It never had to go into dry dock. It never had to be redesigned. It was made the way God directed it. And when Noah walked into it, every provision Noah was going to need was included in the ark. It is like the first creation in Adam. When God brought Adam into the world, he didn't look around for somewhere for him to live. He didn't suddenly begin to find some source of supply for feeding him or giving him to drink. Everything he needed was provided all around him in complete abundance. And we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. And when we step into this new creation, we step into a total, complete, perfect provision which has already been made. There is nothing more to do. All we have to do is appropriate what has been given. And it is all in the promises of the word of God. That is why God's people are living in need, uncertainty, frustration, fear, defeat, when they could be living in peace and victory and abundance because they have not discovered and have not appropriated and have not believed the promises of God. Under the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, God, under a leader named Joshua, led his people into a promised land. The new covenant is very similar. You only have to revise one or two words. Under the new covenant, covenant, under a leader named Jesus, which is the same word in Hebrew as Joshua, God leads his people into a land of promises. That's all. Under the old covenant, it was a promised land. And under the new covenant, it is a land of promises. The provision is there. Now, at the beginning of the book of Joshua, you find God's instructions for going in to possess the promised land. The first thing that God said to Joshua was, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go in and possess the land. Joshua could have sat down and mourned for Moses. The children of Israel say, could have said, we are lost without Moses. What will we do? Here's the man that brought us out of Egypt. Just at the moment we come to the critical point of entering the promised land, he's taken from us. But Moses had taken the children of Israel as far as he could take them. His death was a blessing because it opened the way for a new phase of God's dealings with his people. And I'll tell you today, Moses is dead and there's a new move. You can sit down and mourn for Moses. You can try to go on living as if Moses was still alive, but he's dead. The old order of institutional churchianity is dead. You can just as well accept the shock right now. God allowed Israel 40 days to mourn over Moses, to heal up the traumatic impact of the death of this great leader, and then he said, now, get moving. So when you've had your 40 days of mourning for your church, your institution, the old order, then look facts in the face and acknowledge it's dead. And thank God it is. Because we'll never move on till we realize the past is dead. The Bible says in the words of the Apostle Paul, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It was the mercy of God that he did not allow the grave of Moses to be disclosed because those Israelites would have been back there every year making a scene at the grave of Moses. Did you know that the Muslims in the Middle East 
have a festival every year they call Nebi Musa, the prophet Moses, and they go out and cavalcades, theoretically, to look for the grave of Moses. But they always come back with the same negative result every year. The Israelites have believed the word of God. They don't look for the grave of Moses. They know it can't be found. But I think there are a lot of people still looking for graves. We have to turn our faces from the past and turn towards what lies ahead. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, go in and possess the land which I do give unto the children of Israel, God says. And in the next verse he says, All that land I have given. Notice the two tenses. I do give and I have given. So as the land lay before them, he said in the present tense, I'm giving it to you now. And in the next breath he said, I have given it. And they were still on the east side of Jordan. Now if Joshua had been like the fundamentalist, He would have stood back, folded his arms and said, we've got it all. If he'd been like the Pentecostals, they would have crossed the River Jordan, stopped on the west bank and said, we've got it all. And the Canaanites would have laughed in their faces. You don't have more than you've got. And what you get, you've got to possess. God said there's one way to get it. Every place that you put the sole of your foot upon, that have I given unto you. You don't own more than you put your foot on. It's yours legally. It's yours by divine decree. But it is not yours in experience and in reality until you place your foot upon it. It is time we ceased telling everybody how much we've got when we haven't got it. We have divine healing, the Pentecostals say, and 20% of them are seriously sick. Is that true? It's true. I met... A doctor, a friend of mine in Shreveport, Louisiana recently, he said, I could live off what I get from the Pentecostals, he said. I don't need more. They keep me going. Well, I'm not making fun of them. But what is the good of saying we have it all when we don't? Let's be honest. Let's face facts. Let's take stock and see where we stand and why we stand where we do. What is the root problem? We have not placed our feet upon the promises. We've stood back and allowed the Canaanite to laugh in our face and hold the ground that God gave to you and me. How can you possess the promises? What is the secret of it? I believe God gave Joshua the exact, precise formula. You'll find it in the book of Joshua, chapter 1 and verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Do you find any breath of defeat or failure or inadequacy in those promises? Then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Now, you don't need to raise your hand. But looking back over the last 12 months, how many of you can say honestly, as a matter of experience, during the last 12 months, I've made my way prosperous and I've had good success? And you're living in the fullness of the new covenant. All Joshua had was five books of Moses. And God told him, if you keep this book in your mouth and in your mind and you act according to it, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. You'll be a conqueror, You'll divide to this people the land which I've given them for an inheritance. What is the secret? It's all in the book. The book of the law was all that Joshua had of the word of God. He had five books. We have 66. The principle has not changed. This book shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. When it comes to appropriating and acting on the word of God, in what area of the human personality do we begin? That's not what it says. No. Well, let me say it again. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. That's where it begins, the mouth. Did you know that? Go to the New Testament, Romans 10, 8, 9 and 10. The word is nigh thee, even the word of faith 
which we preach in thy mouth and in thy heart. Not in thy heart and in thy mouth. That's what you would have written. But Paul said, in thy mouth and in thy heart. Where does it begin? In the mouth. Listen. You cannot say the wrong thing with your mouth and prosper. You cannot make the wrong verbal confession and have God's blessing on your life. Hebrews 3, 1, Jesus Christ is the high priest of our confession. He's only obligated to honor by his high priestly ministry that which we confess publicly with our mouth. For with, let me continue, Romans 10, 9, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth Jesus as Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Where does it begin? In the mouth or in the heart? In the mouth. And then it's in the heart. And then Paul turns it the other way around, Romans 10.10, 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What brings us into salvation? Believing in the heart? Confessing with the mouth. You do not have salvation until you confess with your mouth. Now, salvation is the Bible word for the all-inclusive provision of God for his people. It includes everything that God has made available to you through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It includes forgiveness of sin, salvation from the power of sin, deliverance from the power of Satan, healing for your physical body, and all your financial and material provision, it is all included in the one word, salvation. In Psalm 78, it says concerning the Israelites that God was angry with him because they trusted not in his word and believed not in his salvation. Do you know that that makes God angry when you do not tr believe in his salvation? And you look at Psalm 78 in the context and examine the use of the word salvation. It was every provision that God made for them from the Passover deliverance onwards. It was his salvation. The opening of the waters of the Red Sea, the sending of manna upon them from heaven, the giving them of water to drink out of the rock, the fact that their shoes didn't wear out, that their clothes didn't wax old, the fact that God led them by day by a cloud and by night by a pillar of fire, Every provision that God made for his people in every aspect of their lives was summed up in one word, salvation. And they grieved God because they did not believe in his salvation. How many of God's people today are grieving God for precisely the same reason they do not believe in his salvation. Salvation is every benefit that you'll ever need procured through the death of Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. That's salvation. He became poor that we might be made rich. That's salvation. He died our death that we might have his life. That's salvation. He was banished to hell that we might have access to heaven. That's salvation. He was made a curse that we might receive the blessing. That's salvation. It is all salvation. It's all through Jesus. It's all in the cross. It's all by the promises. There's only one word that describes everything that God has provided for us. It's salvation. How do you appropriate salvation? The word is nigh thee, where? In thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith, not the word of unbelief which they preach in the church down the road. The word of faith which we preach. Let me tell you something just in, in parenthesis. There are two things that come by hearing. Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's one thing. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Shall I tell you something else that comes by hearing? Unbelief. And you cannot sit and listen Sunday after Sunday to negative, faith-destroying preaching and retain your faith. Then run out to the Full Gospel Businessmen's Convention to get a little shot in the arm for your faith. You can't live an unbelief three Sundays in the month and have faith at the end of it. God has made provision for you to have faith. It comes through the hearing of his word. And the book of Proverbs says, My son, 
cease to hear the instruction that causeth thee to err from the words of truth. Stop listening to lies because it's in your own best interest. Feed on the truth. Love the word of God. Believe the word of God. Confess the word of God and you will be blessed. You will be abundantly provided for and you will prosper. The word of faith is nigh thee in thy mouth and in thine heart that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you want God's salvation in any aspect of your living, you begin by confessing it. You do not need to be an advertising agent for the devil because he has plenty of them already. Do not go around talking about all that the devil can do and all that the devil has done and all your problems and all your sicknesses and all your shortcomings and all your failures. It may sound holy, but it's very dishonoring to God. A lot of what we call holiness or even humility is just rank unbelief. That's all it is. You are not paid to advertise the devil. He's got a lot of paid agents doing it and he doesn't pay you anything for it, so why do it? Psalm 77, verse 12, is a beautiful verse. I will meditate also of all thy doings and talk of all thy works. Talk God up, talk the devil down. You know the lady that says, Brother Prince, I never can memorize scripture. I just don't have that kind of memory. But she gets sick and she goes to the doctor's office and sits there for 30 minutes waiting to get in. The doctor talks to her for 10 minutes. She comes outside, meets her friend on the sidewalk, and she can tell that lady, friend, everything the doctor said inside. She can memorize what she's interested in and what she believes in. If you were interested in the Word of God, you'd remember it. If you don't remember it, there's a lack of interest. It isn't making an impact on you. This is the recipe. This is God's provision. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Thou shalt observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. God is not the author of defeat. He's not the author of failure. He's not the author of discouragement. The Holy Spirit is the comforter, not the discomforter. He's the encourager, not the discourager. All negative, fearful, faith-dissipating talk originates with the devil and not with God. Don't let it pass through your lips. Close your lips when it comes to the negative. Don't advertise what the devil is doing. Talk God up. Know his word, speak his word, believe his word, act his word. God has guaranteed it. He has stood behind it. It's unconditional. Every need you'll ever have in your life is already provided in his word. Are you sick? Are you in need of physical healing? Are you in need of physical strength? Listen to what he says. Proverbs 4, 20, 21 and 22. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. God's words are life and health to all your flesh. When you have health in all your flesh, you cannot have sickness anywhere there. You cannot have health and sickness in the same place at the same time. Psalm 107, verse verse 19 and 20. Then they call unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. He sends his word and heals them, and delivers them from their destructions. Three things in God's word, salvation, healing, and deliverance. They're all in the word. If you need salvation, it's in the word. If you need healing, it's in the word. If you need deliverance, it's in the word. If you need provision for material and financial things, it's in the word. It's all there. He has given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. They're given by the exceeding great and precious promises, that by these promises ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world to lust. As you appropriate the words of God, as you believe his promises and act upon them, 
you receive within you the very nature of God himself, for God is in his word. This word is the incorruptible divine seed of God. Every area in which you receive it and plant it and cause it to grow, it springs up and brings forth the divine nature within you. And as the divine nature takes over, the old carnal corrupt nature is done away with. This is God's process of making you like himself. It's transforming you by his word, believed, appropriated, and acted upon. Many of you have problems with your children. Your children are rebellious, unruly, unsaved, and a heartache to you. I told you the reason, didn't I? Because thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. But thank God that doesn't need to be the last word. Isaiah 49, 24 and 25. Shall the prey be taken from the terrible, or the lawful captive delivered? That's your child, the prey of the terrible and the lawful captive. But thus saith the Lord, even the prey shall be taken from the mighty and the lawful captive delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. Did you know that? Did you know that was in Isaiah 49, 25? Did you ever put your foot on that verse and say, God, that's for me? No, you see, the provision was made and you weren't living in it. Why? Because you didn't know it was there. What's your problem? Lack of knowledge. What do you spend your time on? The TV, the newspaper, the horoscopes? I served for six months as associate pastor of Assemblies of God Church in Minneapolis. One of my duties was to visit the sick and there were plenty of them to visit. And I had to go around, and many times I was in the hospital. And so many of them were sick with cancer. And I'll tell you, this became a rather depressing routine. And after a while, I said to myself and to God, I said, God, whatever is the wrong, here are these full gospel people. They believe the full gospel. They've got it all. And they're dying one after another with cancer. I said, is, does this have to be? What's the reason? And I believe that God gave me this answer from his word. Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If ye sow to the flesh, ye shall from the flesh reap corruption. But if ye sow to the spirit, ye shall from the spirit reap life everlasting. Of course, the majority of Christians always assume that statements like that were made to the unconverted. But check on your Bible and you'll find that statement was made to Christians. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, that doesn't mean going out to nightclubs necessarily. The flesh is the old, carnal, unregenerate, rebellious, Adamic nature. If you indulge that nature, if you spend hours in front of the television, Hang on that telephone by the hour gossiping with your lady friend and don't have ten minutes in the day for the word of God. You are sowing to the flesh and of the flesh you will reap corruption. And cancer is just one form of corruption. That's all it is. What you sow, you reap. God has ordained this in every area of life. You cannot sow a banana and reap an orange. You cannot sow to your carnal nature and reap from the Spirit of God. If you sow the seed of the Word of God, it's incorruptible seed and it produces incorruptible life. Incorruptible life cannot be overcome of that which is corruptible. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here is the essence of the entire Christian life. It's living by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. This is the life of faith. This is walking in the footsteps of our father Abraham, in the footsteps of his faith. When God said it, Abraham believed it. It was sufficient for him. He didn't ask for secondary evidence for the truth of what God said. He didn't insult God by saying, God, I'll believe you if I get confirmation from another source. 
It sometimes amuses me when people quote psychiatrists in support of what God has said in his word. Personally, I don't believe the word of God needs the confirmation of psychiatry. And if you are looking to alternative sources for the confirmation of what God has said in his word, you have a spiritual squint. God's word does not need confirmation from other sources. If you believe and act on the word, God will confirm his word. And that's what counts. They went out and preached everywhere. They preached the word. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word with signs following. As far as I'm concerned, I could care less as to what secular science or even professing theology has got to tell me. The confirmation I want is God's confirmation of his word. And when I act on it, when I speak it, when I believe it, God confirms it. This is the spiritual life. It's not being so airy-fairy, so heavenly-minded that your feet don't touch the ground. It is living by the word of God. It is taking God's word for every situation, every circumstance, and believing what he says and nothing else. This is to be spiritually minded. The scripture says, if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. I want to tell you that I thank God for the people that believe in the blood of Jesus. There aren't too many of them amongst professing Christians today. But on the other hand, I also have to tell you that a lot of Pentecostals misuse the blood. I was dealing with a lady once that had done some of the meanest and cheapest acts you could ever perform against somebody else. She said, don't talk to me, brother, it's all under the blood. She was more wrong than she knew. Shall I tell you something? You cannot apply the blood to your sins. There's only one person that applies the blood, and that's the Holy Spirit. It says in the book of the prophet Isaiah, Woe to them that cover, said the Lord, with a covering which is not of my spirit. You don't apply the blood, you meet God's conditions. The Holy Spirit applies the blood. If we confess our sins, if we come to the light, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, keepeth us clean from all sin. The blood of Jesus does not cleanse in the dark. If you want to be kept by the blood... You have to walk in the light. And the first result of walking in the light is that you have fellowship with your fellow believers. We have fellowship one with another. If you are out of fellowship with your husband, your wife, your fellow believers, you are not in the light. And if you are not in the light, you are not kept and cleansed by the blood of Jesus. This is God's law. The basic requirement is to walk in the light. If we walk in the light, two results follow. First of all, we have fellowship one with another. And I'll tell you this, out of fellowship is out of the light. The moment you're out of fellowship and in a wrong relationship with your fellow believers, you're out of the light. And when you're out of the light, you're not under the blood. Secondly, the other result is that when you walk in the light, the blood keeps you continually clean from all sin. I have heard many people, and I do it myself, plead the blood over this or that. But I'll tell you in actual fact, if you as a child of God are walking consistently in the light, you don't need to plead the blood. You're under the blood automatically. You have its full protection. What you've got to be concerned about is that you're walking in the light. That's the vital condition. And you cannot have the blood of Jesus covering sins which you have not confessed and repented of. The Holy Spirit will not administer the blood. You cannot be right with God and wrong with your fellow believer. What is it to walk in the light? I'm coming to the close of my message. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light under my path. What do you walk with? You walk with your feet. What do you walk on? The path. What is the light for your feet and the light for your path? It's the word of God. What is it to walk in the light? It's not some mystical remote experience. It's just to walk in simple, daily, practical obedience to the word of God. That's all it is. That's all you have to do. 
You may not necessarily understand the remote future. You may not know what lies ahead tomorrow. But on your path at this moment, there is sufficient light to take the next step. And that's all that God has promised you. I remember a time when I was so concerned about what lay ahead in the future. I was worrying about the course of my life and the development of my ministry. I was badgering God with my problems. And God spoke to me through the gifts of the Spirit. And he said, walk by the light that is on thy path. And I thought, but God, I really don't seem to have much light. And God showed me out of Psalm 119, verse 105. My word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. If you will study and obey my word, you'll never have darkness on your path. You may not see more than one step ahead, but every step you have to take, there'll be sufficient light for that step, and that's all you need. The rest is not your responsibility it's God's responsibility. Jesus said, He that followeth after me shall not walk in darkness, but he shall have the light of life. Where are you today? Are you in the light? Are you walking in the light? Are you living by the word? Are you in the blessing of God? Does your heart overflow with his joy and his peace and his abundance and his goodness? Are all your needs supplied? Or where are you? The answer lies in your relationship to his word. The great majority, and I say this with love, I've been associated with the Pentecostal movement since 1941, which is longer than most of you. Not all of you, but most of you. The great, desperate, crying need of Pentecostal believers is to get back to the word of God. They spend practically no time on the serious teaching and study of the word of God in most of their assemblies. Hardly ever. They have a little sort of whipped up, pepped up, frothy little message. Somebody said sermonettes make churchettes and Christianettes. And I think that's pretty true. Friend, if there's a desert all around you, you don't need to live in it. I like the story of Caleb and Joshua. They went into the promised land with ten other spies, saw it, believed the promises of God. The other ten disbelieved and God disinherited them. That whole wicked generation was rejected by God for their unbelief. The scripture says there was one reason why they could not enter in, because of unbelief. But God said, Joshua and Caleb, because they believed me, they shall inherit the land on which their feet stood. And 45 years later, when Caleb was 85, and they were inheriting the promised land as God had promised, Caleb said to Joshua, he said, give me this mountain. I like that. I'm not asking for a valley. I'm not asking for a plain. Give me this mountain, because this was the mountain I walked on 45 years ago. And then he said this. He said, for as my strength was then, 45 years ago, so is my strength today, both for peace and for war, both to go out and to come in. That's good. That's the kind of Christianity I like. If faith will do that, I'm happy for it. The gospel is good news, you know that? If you ever hear anything that isn't good news, remember it's not the gospel. Now what was the secret that kept Caleb in that totally different condition, spiritually and physically, from all the rest of his generation except Joshua? Shall I tell you the answer? The rest of the generation lived in the wilderness. Caleb lived in the Word. That's the difference. It doesn't matter where you are or what is round about you, you don't have to live in the wilderness. The alternative is to live in the Word. It will keep you spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, materially, in every avenue, aspect of your life. Tell me, do you believe that the power of the devil is ever going to get so strong in this world that God will not be able to fulfill his promises? But you act that way. You many times you act that way. Now, I, I've had to ask myself this question because I see the power of Satan increasing on every hand. It's very manifest, not least in the area where we are this morning. It is, it is very, very... No, I'm not, I'm not jesting, but if there was ever a pocket of satanic power, it's this area, and you know it much better than I do. And when I see this, I'm a realist. I face up to it. The power of Satan is increasing. Then I say to myself, is Satan ever going to get so strong that God will not be able to fulfill any of the promises of his word? My answer is no. I can still live in the promises. 
Standing on the promises, we sing. Somebody said, and what we're really doing is sitting in the premises. <laughs> well, the Lord bless you and help you not just to stand on the promises, but to do something about it. Find it, appropriate it, act on it. Let me give you this little example, and I close, just to be practical. So you wonder what the future holds? You're not quite sure whether your life is in the will of God? You're a little anxious and uncertain, and you're kind of groping and feeling your way? You want a promise? I'll give you one. People come up to me afterwards when I preach like this, they say, Brother Prince, tell me a promise for this and a promise for that. I say, it's not my business to be your promise finder. The whole blessing consists in finding them for yourself. Amen. Don't be lazy. You, find, you look and see if you can find any blessings on laziness anywhere in the Bible. God is a lot more indulgent towards the drunkard than he is towards the lazy person. And lots of people who would be horrified to be seen drunk regularly exhibit the symptoms of laziness. Somebody agrees with that one. <laughs> All right, now then, this is just one example. And with this example, just by way of example, somebody says there's 7,000 promises in the Bible. I don't know whether that's true, but somebody counted and found 7,000 distinct promises. Do you know how many times it tells you in the Bible not to be afraid? 365 times, once for every day in the year. And how many of you are afraid? God says it once every day and you still disobey him. Do you know what fear is? It's disobedience. That's right. The same God that said, Thou shalt not commit adultery, said, Thou shalt not be afraid. You think he meant one more than the other? I don't. I think he meant each alike. Right, now I'll give you this promise. Psalm 37, verse 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. For the majority of the promises of God, there are conditions which have to be met before the promise can be appropriated. Now, some of God's promises are unconditional. To give you an example, Acts 2.17, It shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. That's unconditional. God didn't set any conditions for that. He did not say when the churches unite, or the theologians concur, or the bishops agree, because if he put any of those conditions, it would never have happened. But he said, when the time comes, I will do it. And I'll tell you what, you know what? He's doing it. Amen. That's right. He didn't wait for the churches. He didn't wait for the theologians. He didn't wait for the bishops. His moment came and he started to do it. And he's doing it. That is one of the unconditional promises of God. Thank God for it. But the majority of God's promises are conditional. In other words, their fulfillment is only guaranteed when you find and fulfill the conditions. Now, the promise in Psalm 37 verse 5 is, he shall bring it to pass. What are the conditions? There are two conditions. Number one, commit thy way unto the Lord. Number two, trust also in him, then the promise, he shall bring it to pass. Now you have no right to claim the promise till you fulfill the conditions. Let's analyze them briefly for a moment. Number one, commit thy way unto the Lord. Committal is a single decisive act which does not have to be repeated. The best example I can think of is taking your money to the bank. You fill in a deposit slip, you hand the slip and the money over, you obtain your carbon copy, you walk out from the bank and you leave your money there in perfect peace and confidence. You don't go running to the bank at nine o'clock every morning when the bank opens to see if your money's still there. Isn't that right? You have committed it to the bank. You've taken your hand off it. You have perfect confidence in the bank. You've got the receipt. Well, committal is that. When you commit your way unto the Lord, you put it in God's hands and you take your hands off. Committal is not God's hand on one side and yours on the other. It's, it's your life in God's hands, both of them. In the Hebrew, and it's you find this in the margin, it says, Roll thy way upon Jehovah. That's the literal translation. Why does it say roll? In another place it says, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, but the Hebrew says, Roll thy burden upon the Lord. Now I'll give you my understanding of this, which I picked up by experience. When I worked as a missionary in East Africa, I was the principal of a college for training teachers. And the principal was responsible for everything. If a tap didn't work, the principal had to fix it or find some way of fixing it. 
If a key got broken, the principal had to open the door. If there wasn't enough food, the principal had to find it. I'll tell you, I got started every day at 6 o'clock and finished every night at 10 o'clock. It was a full-time job plus. Anyhow, to come back to Psalm 37, verse 5, uh, roll thy way upon Jehovah. One of the things that I had to do was that every now and then the students would run out of rice. At the last moment, nobody ever told me till it was all gone, and I'd have to get in the car and rush down to the Indian store and pick up a 200-pound bag of rice. And then the, one of our problems was that as soon as Africans began to get educated, they had the opinion that they never were going to work with their hands again. It was beneath their dignity. Once they got to be able to read and write and quote things, then there was no more working with their hands. So I deliberately used to try and get them out of this attitude by showing them that though I was the principal of the college, I would work with my hands. And so when this 200-pound bag would come out, I'd get some African to put it in my shoulder and I'd stagger into the food store with the bag on. Well, you know, it's easier to get a 200-pound bag onto your back than it is to get it off. And you can stand there with this thing pressing you down and just not knowing what to do. And that's why I believe the Lord said, Roll thy way upon Jehovah. Because I discovered if you give a little twist of your shoulders and roll it off and jump out at the same time, you get it off without any disaster. And you see, the truth of the matter is that your way, the future of your life, what you have to do is like that 200-pound bag of rice. It's too heavy for you to carry. And God doesn't ask you to do it. He says, just roll it off on me and I'll take care of it. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Step number one, that's an act. Number two, trust also in him. That's an attitude. Once you have committed, you don't go on committing, but you keep trusting. This is the continual attitude. Lord, I've committed my way unto you. I thank you that my life is in your hands. That's all you do. Every time the devil comes and tempts you, well, what about this? What about that? You don't make a new commitment. That would be like going to the bank, taking your money out and putting it in again. Ridiculous. All you say is, Lord, my money's in the bank. I've got the receipt. It's dating. And that is trusting. And God says, if you will first commit by an act, secondly, remain, maintain an attitude of trust, then God will work it out. And you know what he'll do? He will work it out. You don't have to solve all the problems. Walk by the light which is on thy path. That doesn't show you what's beyond the next mountain, but it shows you enough where to put your next footstep. And that's all that God has promised, and it's enough. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet and thank God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Now, if you want to commit something definite to the Lord right now, why don't you do it? That erring son or that daughter or your way or your financial problem. Why don't you take a moment now to commit it to the Lord and get a stamped, dated receipt from God right now for that thing and stop worrying about it and let God take care of it. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for each, every one of your precious children here this morning. We know how many of them have needs and problems. Lord, so many of your dear people are not living in the abundance and fullness of your provision. And we pray that you'll open the eyes of many here this morning to the root cause of this problem, the ignorance of God's word and his promises. Lord, help each one of us to be much more diligent, to spend much more time in your word, to walk by this light that is on our path, to feed upon this living bread which will strengthen us spiritually, physically, and in every area of our being. And Lord, for those that have special problems and special needs, Help them now by a definite act of commitment to put them once and for all into thy almighty hand and from this moment onward to trust thee for the solution. And Lord, we'll be careful in everything that you do to give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.